Public Policy Forum, one of the co-sponsors of this event. I want to thank my co-sponsors, uh, Lynn Williams, who does such an amazing job, uh, uh, Sam McGavern, uh, Morgan, uh, and Andrew from uh, City and State, and Ben Pagnelli from New York Civic. Uh, we have a powerhouse panel here today of uh, political consultants and experts uh, who, um, if I were running for office, uh, and, and maybe I will, I don't know, I would want these four consulting me. So I hope that, um, I hope that you will uh, be able to join in what I think will be, in, a, in just a, a brief second, a lively conversation uh, about lessons from the pros in running for public office. So the bios of Carl Calabrese, Doug Ferrand, who you heard a moment ago, Roger Stone and Jerry Skernick are all in the pamphlets uh, as part of the program. And so I'm not going to repeat all that. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to state briefly what they're doing now, how they're involved in politics today, what kind of services in the case of Doug, Roger, and Jerry they perform for consultants. And then I'm going to ask Carl to talk a little bit about his past as an elected official, uh, as an important figure in the local Republican Party and what he's doing now. So, Jerry, I'd like to start on the far left with you. Uh, could you just tell us what you do for, for candidates at Prime New York? Tell us a little bit about Prime well, New York. I'm glad you asked that question. In fact, I have some material about what we do, and I'll leave it here on the table if anyone's interested. Uh, what we primarily do is uh, provide data to campaigns. We get the uh, voter tapes from the Board of Elections that Commissioner Ward uh, spoke about in the previous panel, and we enhance it by doing things like adding telephone numbers, including cell phones, uh, email addresses. We run the name through an ethnic dictionary. Uh, we sometimes add specific, you know, interesting data that might affect how they vote, whether or not voters own guns, uh, whether or not they're environmentalists, so whether they're likely to be parents uh, of public school children. Uh, and then we put it into an user-friendly format and sell it to campaigns. And then what we also do is then use that data to reach voters and voter contact by doing email blasting or text messaging or robocalls or any other kind of uh, campaign contact. So Jerry, I'm a candidate. I want to find voters to vote for me. I want to find registered voters to sign a petition to help me get nominated. I'm going to work with you. Uh, Hopefully you will, yeah. We actually even have a, uh, a web-based program that uh, help, you know, that, uh, of the voter file that you can match back the information you get from voters and check whether or not they're registered to vote, uh, how often they vote. Uh, you can do that both petitioning, checking your opponent's petitions, and also for get out the vote efforts in your campaigns. Great, thank you. Roger Stone, you're a celebrated political strategist and consultant in this country. You got your start uh, for President Nixon. Uh, you helped elect Ronald Reagan. You've been active here in Erie County with a number of candidates. Uh, you're a nationally known figure. You know, I'm just a pitcher. I'm a little guy from, uh, you know, New York. I want to run for, uh, I don't know, uh, I want to run for state uh, legislature or uh, maybe something else. but. You know, you've deemed uh, it, uh, you know, you're going to talk to me for an afternoon. Um, why am I talking to you? What, what kind of services and, and support am I going to get from you, Roger Stone? Well, first of all, I think it was uh, Speaker Sam Rayburn who said, a guy shouldn't run a campaign for president who's never run a campaign for sheriff. Uh, and therefore, if you've never run a campaign for the state legislature or for the county commission uh, or for the uh, county board of freeholders or the city council, you really can't understand politics because politics is about people and people react the same in local races as they do in presidential races. You just reach them differently. Uh, I'm a veteran of eight national Republican presidential campaigns. Uh, and as some of you may know, I have only recently figured out that both major parties are really identical. Identical on the war in Afghanistan, identical on the Federal Reserve, identical on the Patriot Act, uh, identical. Identical on the war on drugs. So um, I have uh, left the, the party of my parents and grandparents, and I am now running the campaign of Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico, who will be on the ballot in all 50 states. 
Right now, I think he's on the ballot on 49, uh, depending on the outcome of some litigation in Oklahoma. Uh, as the Libertarian Party candidate for president, offering the voters a third choice. It's a different kind of campaign because we are forced to rely very much, although we're entitled to some federal matching funds and some post nomination funds, we're, we are uh, required to really rely on the reach of the internet uh, to educate people about uh, who our candidate is and that there is a third choice, that it isn't just a race between Obama and Romney, or Obamney as we call them. So uh, uh, it is, it's a little different. Uh, I, I'm glad to be here today. It kind of coincides I had to come here for some meetings regarding some local primaries that I have an interest in. Uh, and it's great to see a lot of friends be here with my friend Jerry. I do want to say a good word about Prime New York. This is where I buy my voter lists, and I've always found them to be clean and accurate and swift. So um, an unsolicited commercial. If you, if you need data, these are the guys to go to. Um, I guess to, to answer your question more directly and briefly, uh, I think that, um, and some of these things may have been said previously, but really, Running a good campaign is about having a, an accurate assessment of what your resources are, uh, holding those resources until they can actually have an impact, and then taking a calendar and working backwards from election day, determining when to allocate and expend your resources, recognizing that, that politics has a rhythm, that every campaign, no matter for what office, has a momentum. Uh, and it's kind of like a campaign is like jumping into the deep end of a pool. Once you jump in, you've got to keep swimming. If you don't swim, you'll sink. So the idea that, well, we'll do something in August and then we, the voters won't hear from us again until October 1st, generally speaking, a bad idea. Politics is about motion. Politics is about creating the impression of motion. Politics is about progress. Um, the great news is that the internet has changed everything. There are more people in Erie County logging on every day than there are people reading the Buffalo News. That's the good news f for, for voters. So in the old days, you had a limited number of information outlets, ABC, NBC, CBS, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Buffalo News. And if you weren't covered, if your candidacy wasn't covered in one of those, it didn't exist. It was like the tree falling in the forest. Now the internet has changed all of that. And therefore, I don't care whether you're running for the town council or for town supervisor or the county commission or what you're running for, not including the internet as a major and least expensive portion of your campaign is a mistake. I do no races today in which I don't take the entire voter file, match it for email address, and pummel those addresses with information. I might use the same graphics I'm using in my mail pieces. I'm certainly using the same themes, but the cost is de minimis, uh, and uh, you do have to do some work to make sure you're not getting spammed out, but as I think most of you know, political communications are exempt from the spam uh, 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 blocks, the spam uh, limitations. So um, to run a modern campaign, you want to start, start by taking the voter list and matching it against all the known email addresses. If you're lucky, you'll come up with a 20% match, maybe even a 30% match, but that would mean that on a regular basis, you're reaching all the voters in your jurisdiction very inexpensively and repeatedly. Great, thanks, Roger. Uh, well, Doug Ferrand has already been introduced to this audience and has demonstrated his wisdom and his insight into running for political office, but Doug, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Red Horse strategies sure. and, uh, and, and what you folks do at Red, Ho at Red Horse. Yeah. Uh Again, my name is Doug Foran. We are uh, Red Horse Strategies. Is a uh, we're a full service political consulting firm. Generally, we sign on as general consultants uh, for races in which we do the campaign targeting, campaign planning, recruit and hire staff, uh, oversee them, uh, as well as doing the media, mail, TV, radio. Uh, we also run very, very aggressive paid ground operations, uh, which is. Uh, you know, in, in modern campaigns, we find to be a very effective tool of cutting through the din of, of mass media, uh, but it's also a fairly expensive tool, uh, so it's not something available to a lot of campaigns. Uh, but we do, we do broad-based strategy targeting planning and uh, campaign oversight. Great, thank you. Uh, Carl Calabrese is not a political consultant. He's a former elected official, uh, town council of Tonawanda. Uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, deputy uh, county executive of Erie County. 
Carl, tell us a little bit about what you're doing in your post-political life, uh, and then I'm going to throw the first question of our panel to you. Well, John, when I left uh, public office in January of 2005, I began a uh, lobbying firm uh, with a woman who was our chief lobbyist in Erie County government, a, a lady named Marina Wilcock. She left county service about a month after I did, and she came to me and said, why don't we start a lobbying business? And I said, well, gee, you know, what do you, what do you have in mind? She said, well, we've always lobbied when you were a town councilman and a town supervisor. You lobbied for the interest of your town. You've been lobbying for the interest of Erie County for the last five years as deputy county executive. She said, I've lobbied for the county, for the PTA. She said, but what, let's do it a little differently. She said, let's be the first lobbying firm that is not headquartered in Albany or New York City. And let's concentrate on upstate and western New York companies, organizations, not-for-profits, educational institutions. Uh, because we understand Western New York. We understand the unique challenges and opportunities, and our learning curve will be very short, and we can, we can hit the ground running quickly, and we can represent those types of organizations in Albany. So we began the firm. It was known then as Government Action Professionals. Um, a few years ago, I, I should say that we were then joined by a fellow named Victor Farley. You might remember Mr. Farley. He was chairman of the Erie County Republican Party for probably, I think, 12 years. Um, and then we were joined by Tony Massiello in uh, January of 06 when he left the, the mayor's office. Um, in 2009, Victor Farley and Marina retired, and we brought in a new partner, a fellow named Victor Martucci. Victor was the chairman of the Town of Tonawanda Republican Committee when I was town supervisor. And um, he was vice president of Murano Mark Equity, the largest home building operation in Western New York for 15 years. We brought him on. We changed the name of the company to Massiello, Martucci, and Calabrese. And, uh, I will say that if you went online and checked out our client list, it literally reads like a who's who of Western New York companies, not-for-profits, educational institutions, and it's been a very successful business based on Marina's original model. Great, thank you. So gentlemen, um, the thesis of our candidate college is that anybody can run for office, and everybody should consider running for office or getting involved in a serious way uh, in a campaign to help somebody else run for office. And I want to know, if I may start with you, Carl, if you agree with our thesis, and if you don't, why not? I don't. <laughs> I don't think everybody is suited to run for office, just like everyone is not suited to be a doctor or a lawyer or a plumber or an electrician. Um, there are certain skill sets that candidates have. Now, you can run. Let's understand. Anybody can run, but running and winning are two different things. And from my experience, I find that some people have the skill set and the temperament. And I want you to remember that, that, that concept of temperament, because there's late, later on, I believe, there's a question. Uh, that I'm going to refer back to the issue of temperament. But I do think that everybody has a decision to make what they want to do in politics. I remember when I was a young man, I, I had a town chairman uh, very interested in having me become a future town chairman. And he was trying very hard to convince me to leave my dream of running for public office and instead go into the organizational side of politics. Um, and I remember him saying to me, Carl, all that glitters is not gold. Uh, there's a lot that glitters about the, the lure of public office, but there's also a downside to it. Maybe we can discuss that later as well. But I do think you need to decide where can you be effective. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be involved in politics. There's all kinds of ways to be involved and effective in politics and government without being the candidate or the office holder. There are certain people who have a temperament and a skill set that is very, very good for organizational and strategy when it comes to politics. My business partner, Vic Martucci, if you met him and talked politics, you would find out very quickly that he is excellent at strategy and tactics and organization. Probably wouldn't be the best candidate in the world, vice versa with other people. So find a, assess yourself. What do you enjoy? What are you good at? Is it the organizational side of politics? Is it the elected side of politics? Is it the advocacy side of politics from the private sector or not-for-profit sector? All of those have a role and an important role, but I just don't believe, in my experience, that everyone, everyone is cut out to be an elected official and a candidate. Doug, you agree with Carl? I, I, I do, uh, frankly. Look, running for office is hard. It's, it's hard work, um, and it's, it's grueling, and, you know, Carl's absolutely right. You need the right temperament for it. You've got to be a little bit thick-skinned because you're going to get attacked, and you've got to be ready to, to work 24-7 and, frankly, sacrifice a great degree of your privacy uh, to hold public office. I'll never run for office, and frankly, I shouldn't. Um, I did, I, you know, I spent a few years working for the, in the state controller's office as an assistant controller and realized that governing is just not what I enjoy. I like campaigns. I like the head-to-head -head of campaigns and being in fights and things like that. That's what I do. Uh, governance is a whole different game. Similarly, like, running for office is about putting yourself out there in a very aggressive way 
day after day after day after day. I don't want to do it for myself. I'll, I'll work 24 seven for our clients. I'm just not going to do it for myself. That being said, you're here in this room, obviously you have some interest in politics and, and some interest in running. But I think the point Carl made is you have to do some self-assessment in this, which is are you ready to do the things that you have to do to be a successful candidate? Are you ready to spend several hours a day calling people you don't know and asking for money? Are you ready to go out and knock on doors every night during a campaign uh, talking to voters who you may or may not want to talk to? Are you ready to, you know, when you're out in public, have people approach you with problems that you may have nothing to do with and expect you to, to deal with them? You know, you're out at a restaurant with, with your spouse and somebody comes up and says, by the way, there's a pothole on my street, I need you to fix it. That's your job when you're an elected official is dealing with those things. And so you just have to be ready to make those sacrifices and do it. It's a noble pursuit, but it is not for everybody. So Roger Stone, you've, you've expressed at the opening of this discussion a, a disgust and a disdain for the major established parties in this country, the Democrat and Republican parties. You're now involved in a libertarian effort for Governor Johnson. You know, clearly uh, you see that there's a need for fresh blood, new ideas, new people uh, to uh, uh, improve the political landscape. Uh, and uh, uh, in this country, uh, don't you agree that, that more people, perhaps everyone, should get involved in politics at some point along the way? Well, I'm not opposed to everyone getting involved in politics. Not everyone should be a candidate, however. I think the single most important quality that a candidate can have is discipline, personal discipline. The discipline to, to formulate a plan and stick to it. The discipline to hold your tongue in public in certain instances. The discipline not to take the bait. The discipline to stick to a, span, a spending plan for your campaign that can work. Discipline is nine-tenths of politics. Politics, uh, the candidate part of politics is, is indeed designed for people who are extroverts. I worked for Richard Nixon, perfect example of a guy who was an introvert, who, who was in a business for extroverts. And that's why he looked so uncomfortable in public. It's why he had trouble with small talk. Uh, sure, he was able to think grand thoughts, but he was not, I hate this expression, a people person. He did not relate well on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, and, and therefore, he was, uh, he was an extrovert, he was an introvert in an extrovert's business. You, you cannot have a fear of rejection and be a candidate. If you are going to be crushed because you call someone on the phone and you ask them to make a contribution and they say no, or if you shake hands at a subway stop and you ask for someone's vote and they're going to say, no, I wouldn't vote for you, if you were the last person on earth, then you're in the wrong business. You can have no fear of rejection. Uh, the good candidate is the one, okay, I didn't get that vote, on to the next person. Uh, also, the person who realizes that the, the guy who's trying to hold you and wants to talk about the issues for 20 minutes is only trying to hold you up from talking to the next voter. So it is uh, discipline, extrovert, no fear of rejection. Those are the things you need to be a good candidate. Uh, Jerry Skernick, you know, you uh, started your political campaign uh, working for then Congressman Ed Koch, helped him become Mayor Koch. Uh, he rose from out of a pack from seventh or uh, eighth uh, in a primary season, 1977-78, uh, and went on to a famous storied career as mayor in New York. He, for a lot of people, I worked for Mayor Koch too, and, and for a lot of people, Ed Koch represents the kind of every man, uh, anybody who should consider running for public office or getting seriously involved uh, in political life. Um, you know, what's your takeaway? Do you, you think more people, anybody, can run for public office? No, I agree with everyone else, but I think it's interesting that we come at it from different reasons. I, I for example, would never run, even when I was a teenager, first interested in politics, I never wanted to run for office because, uh, you know, I, I knew I couldn't be nice to people at 7.30 in the morning <laughs> at, at the subway. I, yeah. uh, un however, unlike Doug, I, you know, I worked for eight years for Mayor Koch in, in the mayor's office and thought it was great. I don't, I don't mind working in government. I could even conceive if somehow I got to be an elected official liking being an elected official, but I, I'm not willing to make the effort to become an elected official, and you know, and, and you gotta have that current kind of personality to do that. Uh, and you know, and you know, but and Ed Koch, I don't think was like every man. He was he was an ambitious guy. He was driven. Uh, uh, he was an extrovert, not like rich, you know, a complete extrovert. Not in, not in, not like Nixon, not both. 
Uh, I mean, he he ran for office, uh, you know, tr twice before getting elected uh, and lost. Uh, so, you know, he's not he's not like me, and he's not like uh, a lot of people. Um, all right, so. We have a self-selected group here of people that uh, sort of run the gauntlet of asking these questions about whether they want to run for office or not. They think they have uh, some of the attributes that the four of you uh, describe as necessary to be involved in a campaign or to be a candidate. So tell our audience, gentlemen, what, what is the most important consideration before you decide to run for office? Let me try to jump in. Okay, Roger, go ahead. Because I go back to something Jerry said that I think is very important. To run for office, you cannot fear losing. There is nothing wrong with running for public office and losing. The very best candidates, Ed Koch, uh, Tom Kane, the former governor of New Jersey, are guys who ran and lost. Losing is a building process. Losing is an investment. When you run and lose, more people know who you are, more people know what you look like, more people know what you stand for, more people remember your name. There, there is nothing whatsoever wrong with running and losing if you view it as a, as a forward-looking building process. If you can't take defeat, don't even try this. If you can take defeat in stride and just realize that it is a building block on your way to the next office that you may seek if you are that committed to public service, then this is indeed for you. Let me say, I lost my very first race. I ran for the New York State Assembly in 1976. I was 24 years old. Um, and I lost, but ran a, a pretty good campaign. I was endorsed by the Buffalo News. I was endorsed by the Tonawana News. I was endorsed by the then Courier Express. Um, it, it was a good race, and it was a good loss if there is such a thing, because as Roger said, it was a building block. It was a learning experience. Um, and when I won my first race for the town council in Tonawanda, I always said I would not have appreciated it and enjoyed it as much if I hadn't felt the pain of loss. Having felt that pain of loss and then the thrill of the victory, uh, it really made it that much more special. And no loss is permanent. I ran against the, my, the majority leader of the Erie County Legislature, Len Lenahan, now the chairman of the Democrat Party in, in Erie County, in 1991. I was a councilman. And Len won. Uh, but again, it was a spirited, good race. I raised more money that year than any other candidate for county legislature except Len Lenahan. Um, but two years later, in 1993, I got elected town supervisor with 65% of the vote. So I, I believe that if you run a good campaign, if, if those of you who frequent a bar once in a while know that if you have an extra drink coming, what does a bartender do? He puts a little empty shot glass upside down in front of you. That means you got one coming. I believe voters do the same thing, that if you come to them and you make your appeal for their vote for a particular office, and for whatever reason, they, they're not ready to vote for you, but they say, boy, that's a sharp person. I like a lot of things he or she said. I'm going to give them one of those upside down shot glasses. You got one coming. Come back to me again in the future on another race another time, and I might give you a vote. I think that's what happened to me in 91 to 93, going from a loss to winning with 65% of the vote. I think a lot of people I approached in 91 said, you know, I like Lenny, he's been a county legislator for a while, I'm not ready to vote for you, even though I think you've done a good job on the town board. Here's an upside down shot glass, you got one coming in the future. That was two years later. I, I, would, I would agree with that, but I would throw in a caveat, which is you don't just want to throw your name onto every ballot, every opportunity to come out if you're not prepared to really engage in the race in a meaningful way. You don't want to be a perennial gadfly candidate, uh, which is, you know, if, you, if you go into one race, you run it well, you lose, and then you know, something else comes up and you're like, sure, put my name out there. And your name goes out there, but you don't raise the money and you don't campaign hard and you just leave your name on the ballot, you're going to lose credibility with the voters. Like if you're running, you got to run serious. If you're putting your name on the ballot, you better be ready to campaign. Uh, otherwise, you will end up undermining yourself further down the road. Always run to win. Always. There's no other reason to run. Run to win. You might not win but you, you will hold yourself in good stead and you will prepare yourself. Just the quality of a candidate who's run and lost. I, I'm not a Mitt Romney fan, but I have to admit his performance in this election is superior to his performance four years ago because you learn how it works. And you, there's not, no, substi no better substitute than on-the-job training. You learn firsthand how the entire system of politics works. Uh, and second-time candidates are always better the second time. Well, Mitt spent the entire 
yeah. last fall not being the front runner as one after another after another of GOP candidates came up and he stuck at it, which I think, frankly, people eventually respected and some of the other candidates fell by the wayside for a number of other reasons. Jerry, there's this idea uh, among your colleagues here that you have to be prepared to lose in order to win and that that may be the most or one of the most prime uh, important considerations yeah. of running for office. In, in 1992, I remember uh, New York City Councilwoman Carolyn Maloney told me she was thinking of running against uh, the congressman from the Upper East Side of Manhattan, Bill Green, who was the most liberal Republican congressman in the United States, who had uh, succeeded Ed Koch and vanquished a you know, series of Democrats over and over. And she said, what did I think? And I, similar to what you guys said, I said, there's nothing wrong with running and losing as long as you can afford it financially and psychologically, that you know, you're not gonna bankrupt your family and yourself, and you're not gonna be so demoralized if you lose that you know, you're never gonna to wanna to run for office again. You know, I'm, I'm sure she would've run anyway, it had nothing to do with my telling her that, but she not only won, ran, ran she won, and she's still in Congress uh, you know, as the ranking Democrat on a major committee. No, yeah, you know, one more thing. You've got to have a circle of advisors that can assess the environment and your situation in that environment with a detached view, because once the political bug bites you to run for office, you may very well become the worst person to assess your situation. You need trusted advisors who can, in a detached, disinterested way, say to you, look, this is not the time to do it for these reasons. Uh, if I had listened to a person in 1976, a very good grassroots politician, he was the town highway superintendent, and he said to me in 76, Carl, don't run for the state assembly this year. I said, Paul, why not? He said, because it's a presidential year, and we'll get a 25% increase in Democratic voters who come out once every four years for presidential elections, and they vote the line. And it's going to cost you. You're not going to be able to win in this town in 1976. I had the bug real bad. I didn't listen to him. I ran and I lost. It was real good advice. So it's tough to do, but get yourself some good, trusted advisors who understand the business and can give you a good, rational, third-party assessment of what you're getting into and what your chances are. Roger, it looked like you wanted to make a point following. Well, I think the, the best example of this that I often use <clears throat> is uh, my longtime 20-year client, uh, Arlen Specter. Arlen Specter was an assistant district attorney in the city of Philadelphia, uh, an appointed position. The district attorney decided to retire, and Specter went to the Democratic leadership and said, I want to run for district attorney. And they said, no. You're Jewish, that's an Irish C. You can't run. So Specter went over to the Republicans and said, I want to run for district attorney. They said, you have to be kidding. We haven't elected a Republican district attorney in 100 years. He said, well, I can't win the Democratic nomination. I really was running the office anyway as the chief deputy. I'm certainly responsible for most of the high profile busts. So he ran as the Republican candidate for the district attorney, and he won. Then the party came to him two years later and said, okay, you're district attorney, we gave you our nomination, you have to run for mayor. He said, well, I don't want to be mayor of Philadelphia. He said, I like being district attorney. The mayor's office and the district's attorney's office are not up in the same year. So he ran for mayor and he lost. Then he ran for re-election as district attorney. Unfortunately for him, it was 1974, he lost. Then he ran for governor of Pennsylvania in the primary, he lost. Then he ran for the U.S. Senate against a guy named John Hines. He lost. Then he decided to move to New Jersey and take the bar examination uh, and practice law in Atlantic City. So he got an office in Atlantic City, and he could have been waived in for the bar as a former DA, but he insisted on taking the New Jersey bar, so he took it and he passed. Then Senator Richard Schweiker announced that he was retiring, and Arlen Inspector said, well, maybe one more time. <laughs> He won that seat and he went on to be the only U.S. Senator in Pennsylvania history to serve four terms in the U.S. Senate, which I think makes the point is you cannot be afraid to lose and that every race is a building block for the next race as long as you conduct yourself in the campaign in such a way that voters would vote for you in the future so that you're not destroying your reputation or scorching the earth. Uh, that tenacity, regardless of what one thinks of Specter, that tenacity, that willing to keep trying until you achieve your goal, 
is, I think, the most laudable thing uh, about him. Uh, this, the desire for public service was so great that he kept trying until he succeeded. I think it's the best example that I know of. Another good one is Abraham Lincoln. Look at how many times Abraham Lincoln lost races before he became President of the United States. So you got to lose to win. But tenacity, I think really the lesson here, the, the moral to draw from the four of you is tenacity is the power of paramount uh, attribute and characteristic well, of, of You know, I, I, I think it, it, it manifests itself in more than just multiple races. The reality is in the context of any individual campaign, you're going to have good days and bad days. You're going to have ups and downs. Bad news breaks, it happens on you. If you're the kind of person who, when that happens, when you don't get the newspaper endorsement, when you don't get the party committee endorsement, you pack up and go home, or you just sort of pout and sit down for a while, you're not going to win your campaign. You've got to be pretty bullheaded about just you know, following it through to the end, or there's no way to be viable. And you will have bad days in a campaign. It's a guarantee. So let, let me, let's turn the, the discussion in, in a few, mother, few other directions or look at a few more facets of, of these kinds of questions, the consideration of who should run, how to run, what you need. Let's talk about endorsements, uh, gentlemen. Uh, how important are endorsements? Uh, Jerry, you, you've been dealing with um, uh, New York City politicians who endorse and cross-endorse and then denounce each other and then come back the next election cycle and endorse each other again. And there's a lot of endorsing that goes on in New York City politics. It seems to be a, a cottage industry all of its own. Is it, does it have any impact on, on elections? Uh, I got to give the uh, cop-out answer was it depends. Uh, there's, they're what we call independent verifiers. It's, so, you know, uh, a letter from, you know, your wife endorsing you, eh, that's, probably nice, but it's not an independent verifier. That's not someone, uh, but, you know, Buffalo Evening News endorsing you probably means something to voters. Uh, local congressman endorsing you in a, in a primary against uh, an incumbent probably means a lot. Uh, it really varies. On the other hand, endorsement from somebody who's not particularly popular probably doesn't help too much. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Mitt Romney endorsing uh, somebody running in a overwhelmingly Democratic district is probably not going to help him at all. Uh, Roger, if I'm a candidate, particularly an insurgent candidate or, or a, new, a new candidate, um, a fresh, fresh face on the political scene, uh, do I want to spend a lot of my time and resources cultivating endorsements? Well, I think endorsements, first of all, I don't think political support is transferable. And that is a mistake, I think, that is sometimes made. So, for example, if Ron Paul were to endorse Mitt Romney, it would have no effect because Ron Paul's voters will never vote for Mitt Romney under any circumstances. Uh, and it would actually hurt Ron Paul's brand. It would hurt him more than it would help Romney. On the other hand, if you are running for the assembly, uh, and you were filling the seat of someone who's been there for 10 terms, and you can get them to do a letter and a robocall for you, and you're largely unknown, yeah, I think that can be a very effective endorsement because the people will take someone they know and respect vouching for you does count if you're not that well known. So I think it depends on the level. I think it depends on the application. But the idea that A will win because B has endorsed them, it, it doesn't work that way. As a general rule, political support is not entirely <clears throat> transferable. Uh, it, it may be an independent verifier that helps you raise money or get you greater credibility with, with the reporters, but generally speaking, I think endorsements are over, uh, overvalued. Overvalued. Doug, you agree? And how much, how much time does Red Horse spend uh, campaign to campaign working on endorsements uh, towards candidates? How much time do we spend? Relatively little. Look, I mean, candidates like endorsements. They, they, they love them. Uh, but I, I think Roger's point is very well taken. Look, you, the fact that you know, somebody else has political support and they endorse you, their voters aren't going to come to you. And a lot of endorsements are, are very uh, dog bites man type of endorsements, right? If you're the Democrat running for assembly you know, against a Republican and the Democratic county executive endorses you, so what? There's nothing, in, there's nothing particularly relevant about that. Um, you know, first-time candidates sometimes use them to gain credibility, to get a little bit of validity to the voters out there. This guy that you trust says I'm somebody you should listen to. 
it's not a bad way to sort of put something on, on, on your prom card or on your lip, but at the end of the day, the candidate has to close the deal with the voters themselves. It's not going to be because it's not going to be on somebody else's say so. So we do all, you know, every campaign tries to get as many endorsements as they can, and you want the list to be as big as possible. But at the end of the day, you're, as a candidate, your time and resources are better spent, frankly, talking to voters. Now, institutional endorsements, you know, we, we do a lot to get labor endorsements because it brings with it institutional support, money, you know, uh, ground troops, things like that. That matters. Newspapers can be uh, decent validators as well, although I think the impact of that is, uh, frankly, uh, diminished from what it once was uh, to, to a large degree. Uh, Carl, uh, so, you know, if you're a candidate, uh, dial back to your days uh, running for uh, town supervisor or city council, uh, and you're listening to these three guys tell you that you need to take a loss, maybe, before you can win, uh, and that your endorsements, you know, eh, they're nice, but maybe not, you know, decisive for you. Uh, what, what are you thinking? Do you, do you like that advice, or are you going to argue well, against I, it? I, I'm going I'm I'm to listen to it and keep it in perspective, but I'm going to pursue some endorsements. I, I think, especially if you're a first-time candidate, remember, one of the biggest problems a first-time candidate has is name identification. People don't know your name. So if you can get a series of endorsements, um, you can do a press release on every one of those. You know, such and such a group endorses me. Such and such a group endorses me. And every one of those gets printed, even if it's a little small thing, okay? Secondly, you can get access then to their membership list, and you can communicate directly with the membership. Keep this as a caveat. Just because the leadership of a group endorses you doesn't mean the membership is going to vote for you. Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, did not get one union endorsement. He got 44% of the vote of union households. Ronald Reagan did not get any major union endorsements when he ran for president, and yet won 40 Teamsters. Teamsters. Public employee unions, certainly not. But he won, on average, about 40 to 44 percent of union household votes, the so-called Reagan Democrats. So I think it's good for a name ID. I think it's good for a sense of momentum. I think it's worth having somebody on the campaign, not you as a candidate, but somebody on the campaign, you know, sh you know shaking the bushes to see if they can get you some endorsements. But other party officials or other elected officials of your party endorsing you, not big news. Keep it in perspective. It's good for a little blurb. Get your name out there. But it doesn't mean the votes are going to come from that membership. You've got to work for those. I'd like to begin very soon getting everybody involved in this conversation or anyone who would like to be involved in this conversation with your questions. I think you have an opportunity uh, to pick the brains of some of the leading political minds uh, in the country, frankly. Uh, but so while you may be thinking about a question or two to ask, let me just tee up uh, one or two more. I'd like to talk about social media, and then I'd like our panelists to identify some model insurgent or first-time campaigns that they think are noteworthy <coughs> lessons on what to do right or perhaps what to do wrong. But let me quickly ask about social media, uh, gentlemen. It, it's come up already today. I think it's worth another go round. Um, you know, how much time and energy and, and uh, you know, time and treasure should a candidate put into social media in his campaign or her campaign? Uh, Doug, do you want to? Sure. Care to start that? Sure. Look, I mean, social media, obviously, the role of it is growing. Uh, that being said, you know, I mean, not every campaign is going to draw the kind of organic attention that a presidential campaign will draw. So the fact that you, you have a, a really cool website or you have a, a good Facebook page doesn't mean that people are going to be going to it and, and looking for information about you. you know, if you're running for county legislature, uh, frankly, like, you're not going to build a huge social media presence. It's a, it's a good means of communicating with existing supporters. Um, if you can you know, try to keep them uh, continually engaged, send them updates on what the campaign is doing, you can tweet. You can like, you know, put, like, you know, we're having a volunteer day up, up on your Facebook page, things like that. But again, like, I, I think a lot of candidates get into a race, and they've seen some of the, the national campaigns that do draw in significant web traffic, and they think, well, that's going to come to me. It's not. Those campaigns draw in web traffic because they're getting external media that makes people interested in those campaigns, and people are on their own looking for ways to get engaged. You, as local candidates, are going to have to go out and personally recruit, or through your team, recruit every volunteer that you're going to get. Once you've got them, put them on your Facebook page, put them on your email list. If you can buy a good email list, a clean one, and 
don't buy bad ones. Yeah, buy, you can buy, buy from Jerry. Buy from Jerry. <laughs> but like, there, there are plenty of places that'll market you bad email lists that are full of old addresses. They'll trigger spam filters, and you know, you'll you'll get shut down on it basically. <coughs> but you know, that can have value as a means of, of doing outgoing messaging. Um, but for the sort of social interactive media, you're going to have to build that around uh, the relationship that your campaign establishes with your volunteers and supporters. Uh, Roger, how are you folks thinking about social media in the Johnson campaign? Are you excited about social media? You've been around the block many times. It, it's crucial, it's particularly, and it works particularly well at the presidential level. And of course, it's the medium that we can afford, and it has a and it has a broader reach than any other medium available. So, our, our uh, challenge is to be provocative enough to engender enough followership because we certainly have the reach. Um, I think that anybody here who's thinking about running for public office is doing so at a very exciting time. I don't think the full power of the internet and politics has yet been realized. Folks, in 10 years from now, the post office will be closed down. It'll be gone. It'll have no function. There'll be no reason for it. And that will change the face of politics as well because Jerry won't be selling mail labels anymore. He'll be selling email addresses. In other words, uh, as the culture changes and as the net becomes a more and more effective tool, the more effectively it will work in politics as well. So uh, sure, the Johnson campaign cannot at this point afford network television. But in the key states that we're targeting, states like Nevada and New Hampshire and North Carolina and Virginia, Colorado, New Mexico, Oregon, Arizona, it's not hard to reach people on the internet and we're doing so. Uh, and uh, every day, the number of people who know who Governor Gary Johnson is and know that he's on the ballot and know that he's the only candidate who favors legalizing marijuana, the only candidate who's for both gay rights and gun rights, if, as it were, it's interesting. It's also not what they're used to because generally speaking in the country, you have a conservative party and a liberal party, generally speaking. Uh, that wasn't always the case. In the 50s, the, both the Republican and Democratic parties had wings. The wings are over. There are no more conservative Democrats and there are no more liberal Republicans, by and large. So uh, a candidate who is fiscally and economically uh, conservative but socially liberal has rarely been offered to the American people at the national level, like is, as in never. So um, we're hoping that people find that interesting. But without the internet, we would have no ability to communicate those ideas. So I'm a great believer in social media. I think it is an absolute necessary campaign building block. I do agree with Doug. I think it gets less effective the further you go down, meaning it's more effective in a presidential race than in a US Senate race. It's more effective in a US Senate race than in a House race. It's more effective in a House race than a state Senate race. And it gets much more difficult if you're running for the town council. But it doesn't mean it shouldn't be part of your media mix. Jerry, you, you started your business as a kind of direct mail uh, business in many ways. Uh, you've, you've adapted to the internet. You now offer all kinds of services for reaching voters via the internet and via mobile phone. So can you take us to school a little bit on your thinking about social media? Uh, well, things like Facebook and YouTube are, are great way, great and cheap ways to mobilize your own supporters to do things, come to events, reach out to, to voters, but they, they're, not, they're not a way to do voter contact. I mean, the problem in politics is to get a voter to find out who you are and what you stand for. Maybe not for president, but for anything below that. Uh, and so if someone isn't going to open a piece of regular mail or an email, open up an email blast about, uh, you know, Doug Ferrand's campaign for town council, they're sure not going to go to his website or go to his Facebook page. So you got to know what it's useful for. It's useful to, like I said, get your own supporters involved, get them to do specific things. Uh, as Jonathan said, our, our business has completely changed. I mean, we started in 1988, uh, and 99% of our business at that time was literally lists and labels, printed lists, printed labels. Uh, we used to joke that, that two or three people used to buy a voter tape, and literally it was a tape in those days, a nine-track tape, that's, that's what data was on, and because they claimed they had some nerd, you know, their 
nephew's uh, cousin, uh, sister, who's a computer whiz and can work on it. And of those two or three, half, one of them used to call and say, oh, we can't work with this. Send me a set of labels. Uh, now, you know, now it's reach a stage. Anybody who wants labels or lists, we, you know, if you want a thousand or so, I can print it in-house on a laser printer, but otherwise, you know, you got to get an Excel file or some other kind of file and they will email it to you. Uh, similarly, when people first talked about using email for voter contact, I said, that'll never happen. People will never open, you know, people don't want that kind of crap in their email boxes, but they do now. And same thing with, you know, talked about cell phones. I mean, at least enough of them do that it's worthwhile to do it. Some people still don't want it, and, and there is a problem with spam filters. Uh, same thing with cell phones, where well, you can't use cell phones for politics because when, we, when cell phones first came about, you used to have to pay not only to make a phone call, but to receive a phone call. Hey, I'm not going to pay a quarter to listen to uh, somebody call me to tell me to vote for somebody I never heard of. Well, nowadays, most people aren't plans, you're not paying for receiving cell phone messages. So, you know, business has completely changed and, you know, I'm not willing to say that the post office is going to be out of business in 10 years. I'm, I have some libertarian tendencies, but not as many as Roger, <laughs> but uh, maybe 15 years. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's see. Take a shot at that oh, please. I'm sorry. I, I've got a local example oh, of somebody who used social media to get elected to a town board, and it was last year in the town of Chictawaga. A young woman ran for the first time a Republican in a heavily Democrat town. She ran for the town board. Her name was Angela Wozniak. And I wasn't involved in the campaign, but I read the kind of post-campaign analysis in the local Chictawaga paper, and uh, she won. She was the first Republican elected to the Chictawaga town board since my friend Dick Selecki back in the 90s. Um, and she credits social media uh, as the crux of her campaign. She didn't have a lot of money, and she was totally unknown, and she was running with probably a three-to-one affiliation disadvantage. She got herself elected, and she said that her ability to use social media, tap into a base of supporters, build a coalition to 50% plus one, and get elected was crucial on a low budget. Um, I think that might be worth looking into. But, you know, I, I happen to believe, I, I really believe that there's a lot in common between the concept of war and the concept of politics and campaigns. I mean, the word campaign is a military term. We use all these terms, campaign, headquarters, in the trenches, air war, ground war, blitz. I mean, and I read a book once by a retired general who said the great generals of all history, throughout history, have three things in common. One, they never fight the last war. They understand that tactics and technology has changed and they do it and they, they adapt to it and their opponents don't. Two, they are masters at maneuver. They, re, they maneuver very quickly under stress and under pressure. And three, they never want a fair fight. They always attempt to get their strength positioned against their enemy's weakness. I think all three of those are pertinent to politics and with social media. I think in the future, the really good strategists are not gonna fight the last war they're going to figure out that this new tool has a role and a big role, and they're going to figure out innovative ways to use it to communicate. They're going to use it to maneuver very quickly, and they're going to use it to get their candidate's strengths positioned against their opponent's weakness. One of my favorite founding fathers is Sam Adams. Also happens to be my favorite beer. But <laughs> Sam Adams had a very simple rule about politics and campaigns. As pertinent today as back then, he said, put your opponent in the wrong and keep him there. Lots of ways to do that. I think social media is going to be one of them. Well, uh, the use of military campaign uh, <clears throat> metaphors for political campaigns is a great transition or segue to uh, a quick, we have a quick uh, discussion or identification of uh, model insurgent or first time campaigns. And I'd like to just sort of quickly do, do this very quickly and then uh, invite uh, questions from the floor, if that's okay. So, Jerry, if I could start with you. Um, if you were going to offer them, uh, you know, one particular campaign as a model for how to run an insurgent campaign, what would it be? Uh, I actually was thinking about that because you said you had asked that, and you know, the first insurgent campaign that actually comes to mind that was sort of successful, I mean, he didn't get elected, was uh, Eugene McCarthy against Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he was. I mean, I mean, I thought of two insurgent campaigns, right? One was Eugene McCarthy, the other was Ronald Reagan, who were completely different candidates. Reagan was charismatic, McCarthy was far from charismatic, but he had an issue. 
uh, the war in Vietnam. And uh, because of that, uh, he was able to not get elected himself, but achieve the goal of at least his supporters. Maybe it wasn't his goal. His goal was probably to win, but uh, to, to get Johnson not to run for re-election. And I mean, I think that's what you need. That, I mean, that's the main thing an insurgent campaign needs, is a real rationale to get elected Great. or to run. Great. Roger? Well, let's see. When I was 14 years old, I managed a campaign uh, for a guy who bumped off an incumbent Westchester County legislator. We really did it two ways. One, while we had access to money, we didn't put any in the account. So we laid in the weeds, allowing the incumbent to believe we were underfunded and had no resources. Then secondarily, uh, the incumbent was uh, supported a woman's right to choose. My candidate was pro-life, so with some healthy assist from the local Catholic Church and some excellent lists matching those who were pro-life with primary voters. Um, we were able to uh, do a last minute telephone campaign the night before and you had one surprised incumbent. So the element of surprise was crucial and also the identification of a movable constituency and having the resources to move them became the other crucial point. Uh, unfortunately, the Republican legislator who was defeated then decided to run as an independent. He did. He ran to the left, uh, making the Democrat run third. My candidate still won. So um, uh, Jerry's exactly right. Uh, a, an insurgent campaign is usually an issue-oriented campaign or a cause-oriented campaign. Um, and going back to something Carl said that I think is important, and that is that in the in the new politics, institutions have less influence because of the internet. By that I mean the idea that democratic voters vote the way the party tells them to, or union voters, union household voters vote the way the union tells them to, or that voters are inexorably affected by a New York Times editorial. Those things are all false. Today, voters are, can get their own information from television, from radio, from email, from magazines, from newspapers, and therefore you're actually in information overflow. And therefore, more and more, uh, you've seen the breakdown of the parties. One of the reasons why party discipline is broken down is because people no longer have a limited number of, of outlets to get their information from, and therefore people are making up their own minds. Uh, Doug, you were involved in an insurgent campaign of a kind here in Erie County recently. We, Maybe we, you'd like to talk about that. Sure, sure. And to me, there's two different kinds of insurgent campaigns. There's running against a, a strong incumbent, and then there's running against the power structure uh, of, of your own party, which are, these are very different dynamics. But here in Erie last year, uh, we, we were brought in late uh, to run an independent expenditure on behalf of Mark Poland cars. I've actually never met Mark Poland cars, but it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, but you know, it was one of those situations where you know, there, there was an interest in supporting his candidacy by some, some people in labor. Uh, they were looking at it, and the polling data that came out uh, after the primary showed a degree of viability on the part of polling cars that people hadn't anticipated because Collins had such a strong money advantage. Uh, when that happened, you know, the uh, SEIU, AFSCME, a couple others uh, put together a pool of funds and we actually ran a full bore parallel campaign to the actual uh, polling cars campaign where we were doing door-to-door -door work, TV, uh, mail, radio, visibility, the whole, the whole gamut. Uh, and, you know, sort of similar to what Roger was talking about, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think uh, Collins at the time expected that his opponent, who was going to be low on funds, would have this kind of support coming in at the end. He did, and it, it created the upset that ultimately uh, put Mr. Polonkars into the county executive's office. And congratulations, it was a great victory. It was, it was fun. Uh, Carl? The model I decided to use to illustrate the insurgent campaign is a local one, and, and fairly recent. Some of you may remember this, this particular office holder, and, and it fits into what Doug just said. This person ran both, camp, both insurgency campaigns in the same year. He ran against his political party, and he ran against an incumbent. And the person I'm going to cite is the former supervisor of the town of Amherst, Satish Mohan. Everybody remember him? Can I see some hands? You remember Satish Mohan? Satish Mohan came out of nowhere. He was a, a University of Buffalo engineering professor. Um, ran at a time uh, of a lot of upheaval in Amherst. And, and just as was said earlier, um, 
he had an issue campaign, and this was his major piece that he used. Um, and, and, and you'll see it, uh, let me tell you what, I'll read what he says about the issues. And when he, he hits on issues, but he describes them so succinctly um, and really, I think, hit people's hot buttons. Now, if you recall, this was a time of great turmoil in Amherst. There were all kinds of issues. They were doing a revail of property assessments. There was the sinking home issues with the, in one part of town. Town board meetings were going till 3 o'clock in the morning. It was totally dysfunctional. And, and the biggest fight, and it wasn't between Republican and Democrat. Uh, the biggest fights on the town board was between the Democratic supervisor, Susan Grelick, and her deputy supervisor, Dan Ward, a Democrat. It was just ugly. So Satish Mohan comes out of nowhere. And he beats, he does not get the Republican Party endorsement. He runs in a primary, and he beats the Republican endorsed candidate. Then he goes on to challenge Susan Grelick. And this was his piece, and he says, uh, I am not a career politician. I am driven by community needs and a passion to restore the ideals of public service, integrity, and economy in Amherst government. And he says, there are four major problems in Am Amherst, and here they are. Doesn't have 40, doesn't have 45, he's got four. Very high property taxes that continue to rise, period, end of issue. Two, increasing frequency of damage to homes due to sinking, flooding, and foundation cracking. Three, unfair property assessments for the brain drain. Graduates are forced to leave. I promise to accomplish the following. One, reduce town budget by 10% through efficient management of resources. This will lower taxes by 15% in my first year, period. Two, protect and preserve your eight billion, with a B, worth of real estate from flooding, foundation settlements, sinking, and traffic congestion, period. Three, establish a fair and simple property assessment method, period. Four, work to establish a high-tech light manufacturing industry in Amherst in cooperation with Western New York colleges and universities, period. And five, restore integrity and a sense of economy in the functioning of town government, period. That's it. Simple, direct, easy to understand, right on message. And he, what, the other thing he did is he did some unique campaigning that no one had done before. He, he had a great grassroots organization because he didn't have a lot of money. And he instituted something called coffee hours, where he would go into a, 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 a neighborhood, and if someone in the neighborhood said, gee, I'd really like to support you, what can I do? He'd say, would you be willing to have a coffee hour? Would you be willing to invite five or eight or 10 or 15 of your neighbors over your house at 7 o'clock, 7.30? No dinners, no drinks, just coffee and coffee cake. That's all. And let me come over and address them and answer their questions. And he set up an elaborate network of these coffee hours in neighborhoods. You know, there's a, in politics, there's what we call a rule of seven. If you do something good for someone and or you impress them at election time, they'll probably tell seven other people what you did or why they're going to vote for you. So in every house where he saw people, be it eight people or ten people, and he impressed whatever number of them, multiply that by a factor of seven. And he won. Now, I just want to end that story by saying, remember what I said early about temperament. When he got elected as supervisor, he proved to have absolutely the worst temperament in the world for governing. I mean, he just burned every bridge he could. He couldn't work with staff. He couldn't work with department heads. He couldn't work with council members. He couldn't work with anybody. And he lasted four years, burned himself out, and you never heard from him again. So great insurgent campaign, terrible temperament for governing. Is there anything in particular that a woman candidate should pay attention to or do or not do? Or just kind of address that issue generally, if you want. Uh, well, let me say that. I, I do actually think that uh, the public holds women to somewhat different standards than men, and it's a challenge. Uh, men being on the, attack, on the attack can look strong. Women can look shrill. Um, and so I think as a matter of tone, uh, you have to be careful about you know, if, if you're doing negative things. Generally, when the media panel was up here earlier saying you shouldn't speak through, through your spokespeople, if, if you're saying something negative, it should always be through your spokespeople. If you're saying something positive, you say it yourself. Um, so look, I mean, I, I think a mistake that, that frequently uh, women candidates make is they assume that because there are women, a woman, uh, women voters are going to naturally coalesce around them. That's not true. You still have to make the argument. You have to make the case for yourself. Uh, you have to be out there. And again, like, you know, is there still some underlying sexism? Some, certainly. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I think there's more than ample opportunity for women to run and win. Uh, for whatever reasons, you know, not as many women run for office as men, uh, which I think is unfortunate. I think actually we would benefit from more, more women elected officials. I, I think that men and women oftentimes view politics and the campaign process in a different way. I know this from experience. My, again, my former business partner, Marina Wilcock, who was a state committee woman, very active in politics, very astute 
politician. There were many times when we'd be in a campaign strategy meeting and Marina would be the only woman in the, in the room and somebody would come up with an idea, a tactic, and every, every guy would think it was great. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. It's going to kill him. And Marina would say, it's not going to work. It's not going to work with women. This will turn women off. And, and so I think it's important that if you're running a campaign that you build your campaign team in a, a diverse as way as possible from all kinds of standpoints, certainly gender, because men and women, sometimes women have the better read on a tactic as it will relate to voters, and sometimes men. You need both in the room. Um, and build your campaign team as a mini focus group. Get people who are active in your community on your campaign team, because when they go to their church organization or their Rotary Club or their Chamber of Commerce, they're picking things up. They're picking things up about issues. They're picking things up about your campaign. They're picking things up about the effectiveness of your opponent's campaign. And they bring them back to you as a mini focus group that you don't have to pay for. It can be very, very important. But by all means, have both genders in the room because there are going to be times when one of those genders will have a better read on a tactic as it relates to the voters than the other gender. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Any other let me, let me, let me address that because uh, I look at it in the reverse. In all honesty, it's much harder to run against a woman candidate if you're a man. Uh, you cannot attack a woman opponent with the same ferocity uh, or the same uh, velocity that you can a man. Uh, it can hurt you very badly. So I think you have to uh, avoid the kind of uh, attack that can be viewed as bullying. I had a candidate for mayor of Miami Beach who's running against a woman incumbent. And I thought consistently that in the voter forums uh, and in the interviews that he hit her way too hard and way too personal. He was a Yale graduate. She had never gone, she had, uh, was a high school graduate. There was nothing in the data that showed that bringing that up was beneficial, but he brought it up constantly and it hurt him. Uh, would it have hurt him as badly if she were a man? I don't think so. So, um, I think it's got to be viewed very carefully when you're when you have a woman opponent. It also partially depends on the the offers. Uh, for example, in in New York City, uh, women running for judge do much better than men. I mean, for example, most the most powerful elected judge in 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 any in any district is the surrogate judge uh, in Manhattan and Brooklyn. There are four surrogate judges. All of them are women. There's an opening this year in Manhattan. There are two women running. Uh, and it's the same thing for the other kind of judges that are elected. And I think it's, and, I, and in the suburbs also, at least the suburbs of New York City, I'm not, I haven't followed judicial races in upstate and western New York. But, uh, so it depends on the office. I think, I think to some extent, uh, for, for example, judicial races, voters, have, don't have a lot of information about the candidates. And secondly, it's hard to choose between them because judge, judicial candidates can't promise, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rule, I'm gonna put everybody in jail, or I'm, or I'm you know, gonna give everybody a break. They, they can't make promises like that. So I think all else being equal in a race like that, since at least downstate there are more female voters than male voters, women have an advantage. On the other hand, I, I agree with the other Speakers, I mean, woman attacking a, a woman woman candidate attacking a male candidate. Uh, <coughs> some people will think she's being shrill. Uh, we saw that with Hillary when when she ran for president. We have some college students in the room. I wonder what advice you would give to a college student who's not interested for running for office in the immediate future, but's thinking maybe ten years down the line. What are some of the career paths? What are what types of community service? What types of political involvement do you think would be most valuable to them? Volunteer uh, for a on? campaign. Yeah. It's the single best way to learn. Volunteer for a campaign. Uh, I, my first, the camp, first campaign I was involved in was a presidential campaign. It was 1964. I rode my bicycle to the Goldwater headquarters. It's how I got interested in politics. Uh, the next race I worked for was for mayor of the town that I lived in in Connecticut. So I kind of worked my way down, if you were, if you will. But the, the, the single best thing you can do, particularly on campus, particularly in a presidential year, is volunteer and get engaged. Uh, and then uh, whether your candidate wins or loses, look at the next year's elections and the next year's elections. Uh, it's the best way to get involved. I, I also, I'm a former young Republican national chairman. 
probably the only one who's ever left the Republican Party. Uh, but I encourage you to join young Republicans or young Democrats or college Democrats or college Republicans. First of all, you will make relationships that will hold you in good stead for the rest of your life if you choose a political career because the folks you meet, the people you meet, will, will climb the ladder at the same time you do and will end up in influential places in the party or in politics or in government. Uh, and secondarily, you'll, you'll have more access to campaigns, you'll have more access to the process. So I recommend the party auxiliary organizations. I wasn't sure if you were asking someone in college who wants to get involved in politics in 10 years or, or run for office. If it's someone to be involved in politics, Roger's exactly right. If, if it's he or she want to eventually become a candidate, I think beside that, they should join their local block association or community group or beautification group, get involved in the community, uh, which is another reason why I'd never run for office. I would never join any group like that. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a caveat there, though. I, I agree with what Jerry has said and what Roger has said. There's no better way to learn politics, the process, than getting involved in campaigns. And in that process, you will determine where you want to be. You may think you want to be a candidate, but when you see the inside working of a campaign, and you're watching the can candidate, you may say, you know, I really like the organizational aspect better. I'm better suited for it, or vice versa. Um, getting involved in your community will help you learn about your community and what the problems are. But be careful, because people will see an opportunist right away. And if you join a group to benefit you first and that group second, that you will be labeled an opportunist. So if you're going to get involved in the community, pick something you really have your heart into, and you're going to give much more than you're going to come that's that going to come back to you initially. It'll eventually come back to you, but if you're seen as just doing it for self-promotion, not going to help you. Um, I just lost my train of thought. When I think of it, I'll drop well, it. If, you're, a third, if, if, a you're, third if you're interested in politics now, but you're not interested in running for office until, say, 10 years, try to avoid having your picture taken hitting the ball. <laughs> I, I remember. Understand that one of the most important skills you can have is speaking ability. And if you need some help in that now, you're looking down the road 10 years, start doing things that are going to help you become a better speaker. It's a matter of practice. That, that's, I do believe anybody can become a better speaker. When I first started public speaking, uh, especially on radio and television, I would get so nervous, I would literally hyperventilate. That's how nervous I would get. I, I, I'm over that now only because of practice and repetition. So that's a skill you must learn and you must master, and it can be, it can be learned, and it, you certainly can improve. Anybody can improve by doing it and working at it. So those are the pieces of advice I'd give you. Yeah, when I taught a class in Fredonia on politics and media, I always used to ask the students, if we opened up your Facebook page right now on the smart screen, how many of you would be embarrassed? <laughs> and the yeah, heads would go down. So the, the belly shots and, uh, and whatnot yeah. are really not good that's for your Facebook All that stuff page. can come back to haunt you. And Toastmasters is an excellent way. I did Toastmasters for years to develop better public speaking skills. And it's a great method if anybody wants to join your local Toastmasters. Uh, Doug, did you, did you have a comment to make? Well, uh, the, we'll wrap it up. the only thing to add, I mean, I think people have made uh, generally the same points that I would make. Just do it. Like, if you want to get involved in, in politics and campaigns, don't don't wait 10 years. Just do it. Go in and see, see what a campaign is really like. Uh, and you'll figure out if, you, if, if frankly, it is for you. Um, you know, I, I never took a poli-sci class in college, so I don't really know what they teach in those. Uh, but, uh, I took a lot, and I don't know. <laughs> um, I took a lot. I know what they took. Not much. <laughs> Nothing useful. Nothing useful. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, the idea that you can sort of figure out this business through through uh, through an academic approach, I just think is false. You really have to get get your hands dirty and get into it, um, and that's where you'll find the reality of campaigns and politics. Um, but you should volunteer, intern in some. If you want to be elected, intern in somebody's office, volunteer. You know, spend your own time and really just. Find out what it is. Do it. I also wanted to suggest that you don't have to wait uh, till 10 years down the road. I mean, we have an, a, a really good city council member in New York City who ran for office when he was 23 years old, ran against the Republican machine and the Democratic machine. And because he was 23 years old and didn't have a family and attachments and all that stuff like that, he could just knock on doors endlessly. And he, he did so for two years, and now he's one of the most prominent members of the New York City Council. So, you know, a lot of ways, the older you get, the more difficult it becomes to run for office, too. And so when you, you don't have, when you're not shackled by as many responsibilities, that can be a great time to take advantage of it. And oftentimes, if you're a really young candidate, that's an additional draw for the media. 
I uh, was involved in a city council race where an 18 year old uh, ran for it and he got disproportionate uh, media coverage because of the novelty of the being in the race. So don't discount it because of age either. I mean, Chuck, Chuck Schumer ran for assembly successfully uh, during his final year of law school. Uh, and he's had a relatively successful I should say so. Sad, sadly. <laughs> Is there another question? Hi, um, I was just wondering, what's the best way to figure out, like, if you want to get involved on a campaign, you know, because maybe I don't want to run right now, to find out, you know, everyone that's running, I mean, is that available from the Board of Elections? Or the best way to find, you know, and then figure out a candidate that you want to stand up for and volunteer for? I mean, you can get a list of candidates off from, the, from the Board of Elections, but I would actually look for the candidates with the campaigns that are going to have the most for you to do. So I'd see, see what's percolating up in the media, see what their social media presence is, see who looks like they're actually running some sort of operation. Read, then, the, read the news clips. Yeah, read the news clips. Go do a news search. And then just call them up. There's, there's no campaign that you're going to call up and say, I want to volunteer a lot of my time. They'll be like, why would we do that? <laughs> we're, not, we're not interested. Most campaigns, even for the lowest offers now, once they, you know, if they're even semi-serious, they have a web page. You do a yeah. Google search, put in the name, you know, Stone for yeah. Town Board, and there'll be a, usually as a contact uh, information if, if, there. If you as an interested potential volunteer can't figure out how to contact a campaign, that campaign's gonna lose anyway. You know, uh, campaigns have a wonderful ability to accelerate talented people to the top. Um, if you have a skill that's valuable to that candidate, seniority means nothing. Best example I can think of that is uh, Jeff Greenfield. If you've ever seen Jeff Greenfield, political analysis author, uh, he began his political career by volunteering for the Bobby Kennedy for New York for Senate campaign in New York State. He was a golfer. He was getting coffee. Nobody knew him, but Greenfield could write. And one night, he's sitting next to one of Kennedy's speechwriters who's having a mental block. He can't figure out how to phrase something. And Greenfield says to him, "Gee, let me." Can I take a look at what you're, maybe I can help out? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. He writes the paragraph. It stands out. All of a sudden, he's not getting coffee anymore. And within a very short period of time, he becomes the chief speechwriter for Bobby Kennedy. I mean, if you've got a skill that's valuable to a candidate, forget your age, forget your seniority. You will be, you will be put in a position to help. Let, let me double that, double that, which you don't even need a special skill. Uh, that, the most amazing thing to me in politics is how quickly you can get to play a major role my first campaign, I volunteered in 1966 for a city councilman who was running an anti-war candidate for Congress. Within five days, I was traveling with the candidate's <laughs> wife to events. And, you know, I didn't have a special talent for traveling with candidates. It's just I was willing to do Hard it. Work. And, you know, by the next year, I was the treasurer of, I was six, seven, next year when I was 17 years old, I was the treasurer of my local political club because I was willing to do the work. I mean, I needed a calculator to add up the numbers. I wasn't, you know, a math whiz. I mean, I'm no Jeff Greenfield and I was able to uh, you, play a major right. role early in politics. Um, I'm one of the college students that Sam was talking about and I was wondering, um, if any aspect of college student government is similar to public service office. So if any of you were involved in student government or know someone or um, debate or any kind of leadership position in college, what kind of surprised you when you entered real, the real world of politics? Student government politics got me involved in politics. I was president of the student government of Erie Community College. Um, in 1972 and being a county college there were a lot of political issues that year and I got very involved with putting student activities directed towards the Erie County Legislature and that got me involved in politics I continued on at the University of Buffalo uh, but absolutely that got my fire lit was those college days taught me a lot of things uh, about public speaking building coalitions talking to the press uh, working with elected officials it was a very very worthwhile and in my opinion for me anyways a life-altering experience yeah. I, was, I was on my student government and also ran campaigns for student for other people for student government one of one of the people on student I went to SUNY Binghamton now Binghamton University but one of the other people on student government with me at the time was John Liu who is now the New York City Controller he's having kind of a rough year uh, but you know the people who are uh, drawn to that business sort of what Roger was saying about working with the young Republicans or college Republicans or college Dems young Dems people who were there then will rise up through the ranks with you and the relationships that you build then uh, will follow you through life and it can have a lot of value and it is that's very 
that's where you'll get your, your basic governing experience uh, that is relevant outside of the college environment. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, this question is really directed at Roger, but it's really a general question. Uh, how do you win as a Democrat in a Republican district, and how do you win as a Republican in a Democratic district? Because your challenge is, you know, I, I grew up as a Democrat, and so I lean that way. Not that I think they're right or wrong. So, you know, I grew up as a Catholic, so I'm Catholic. Uh, how do you, what's your, what's the strategy? Again, it's a general question, but I think it's more directed at you because you have a hell of a challenge. <laughs> well, <clears throat> a lot of it has to do, I mean, there are certain races that are not winnable because of the demographics and the ways and the, and the lay of the land within the jurisdiction you're, you're, you're contending in. But generally speaking, um, you need to figure out, based on your polling and a precinct swing analysis, where the movable votes are and appeal to those who are not locked in to a, to a partisan position. So for example, when I mail Democrats, I always take out all the Democratic primary voters. They're never going to vote Republican. They're not swing voters. So by definition, the non-primary Democratic primary voters are weaker Democrats than the primary voters. Then I analyze the you know, unaffiliates, as you would call them in, in New York, uh, and determine your targeting there. Then try to find a wedge issue that'll move those those voters off of a partisan position. I mean, I spent my entire life as a Republican, but like you, I'm also a Catholic. When I uh, was in elementary school, my very first mock election, I was actually for John F. Kennedy because he was a Catholic. And my elementary school in Westchester County, New York, had a coming mock election. So I stood on the line in the cafeteria and I told every kid, if Nixon is elected, there'll be school on Saturdays. I remember that argument. I remember and <laughs> It worked. It was my first big election victory. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think I ran in a town that gradually changed from the 1970s of very strong, solid Republican to even and then plus Democrat. And in my last election, um, where we had 8,000 more Democrats than Republicans, I won with 75 percent of the vote. Now, some of that I think is attributed to just having running a good government, but. Running a good government, you know, if you don't tell people you're running a good government, they may not know it. So it was a combination of government skills and political skills, telling people what you did for them and what you're going to do in the future. But remember, you've got your, your, your true believers on both sides who are, you know, your yellow dog Democrats, right? A Democrat who, who wouldn't vote for a Republican if they, or if they were a yellow dog. And you got the same on the Republican side. But most people, you know, you got, are open and you've got a growing independent factor. And as Roger said, critical word, polling. If, if there's one thing you can afford to do as a candidate, it, do a poll. Do a poll early. Spend your, if any money you have, do it on polling. Going into a campaign without a poll is like a, a, a ship captain going into a strange harbor without a chart. No good can come of it, okay? It's only a question of when you run aground, not if. So that will tell you where your votes could be. And that'll tell you what the message should be and how it should be tailored to building that 50% plus one. And in some communities, you just can't do it. Let's face it. Uh, there's some communities that are so Republican or so Democrat, it doesn't matter. But that's the exception. The rule is you can build a coalition of 50% plus one using your base vote and independence with the right message and the right targeting. Uh, I think Carl just made an excellent point, and one that I should have raised, which is the idea that you would run a race for any public office without investing in some survey research, a poll to guide your campaign, is kind of like driving a car with your eyes closed. You will go forward, but you have no idea what you might hit. Uh, even on, in the smallest race, I think it is an absolutely necessary tool because you have to find out which essential arguments will move voters from here to there. A lot of people, I think, have the misimpression that a poll is about who's ahead and who's behind. That's actually the least meaningful piece of any survey, other than to say that if your opponent's at 70 and you're at 5, the odds are not good that you're going to win. But generally speaking, um, you know, we look at a couple different measures. It, it, if you're running against an incumbent, is the incumbent over 55? 
is a challenger over 35. If the incumbent's under 50, generally speaking, they probably beatable. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the job performance rating uh, of the candidate that you're running against? What is their own personal favorable, unfavorable rating? And what is that ratio? The ratio is more important than the actual number. Uh, but to undertake any kind of a campaign um, without survey research, there's a fellow who ran for governor of this state, uh, a billionaire, ran several times as an independent. I'm not going to say any names. <laughs> uh, but the first time he ran for, for governor, he spent about $15 million. Unfortunately, none of those dollars was spent on a poll. Uh, and I think it explains one of the reasons why he did so poorly the first time. So uh, it is unthinkable to me that anyone was going to spend significant resources without taking what we call a bench line survey, uh, which is going to be your roadmap for the entire rest of the campaign. It, it's, it is a, a document you cannot live without and run an intelligent campaign. When, when I was in town government, for town board, town councilman, we did not start a campaign without, as Roger, we called it a benchmark poll. You know, is the town going in the right direction or wrong direction? What are, what are the issues? The numbers of who you're going to vote for uh, were superfluous. It was, it, this was in September. But it, it set the mark, and then we'd go back in mid-October and we'd do a follow-up poll. And that would tell you what progress you've made from the first one, what the numbers were, now the numbers mean a little bit more, and who's weak, who's strong, where to direct your resources the last two weeks of the campaign. But, You've got, to, if you've got money, if you've got to borrow money to start your campaign, use it on a poll. Yeah, I mean, it, look, I mean, I think a, a poll is, as, as Roger said, it's not about who's winning and losing, it's about having the roadmap for how you win. Um, you know, if you're going to spend any money on a campaign, you're going to be spending it unwisely unless you have some good survey research, a good poll to tell you how to do it. In, in the particular case where you're talking about trying to run where, where the enrollment is against you, we also, as we get further into a campaign, often do micro, uh, micro targeting, where you know you you got to break down your universe into smaller concepts than Democrat versus Republican versus Independent. You've got to look at age breakouts. You've got to look at, at voter history breakouts religion, and things like that. Religion, religion. Sex, I mean, you know, and, and maybe you'll find that you know Catholic Democrats over 55 who vote in even years feel this way. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you can start to out of that put together the puzzle pieces that get you to a winning majority coalition. Okay, we have time for one more question. Before everybody rushes for the door, though, after that last question is answered, please take 30 seconds to fill out your survey so we know why this is even more of it less than, less of the next time around. So please, go ahead. Um, recently, there was a council seat open, and I feel that there was somebody who who wanted that seat that was that was highly qualified to to take it um, but instead of him getting that seat somebody else had gotten it that knew people or the bad politics so my question is regarding bad politics the mudslinging the dirty campaigns how do you avoid or overcome all of that uh, I would want, if, if and when I run for office, it to be an honest, clean campaign, no back door, negotiating, none of that stuff. So, but as a female, I already have something against me, so how do I overcome all of that? Does that make sense? Well, you're not. I mean, <laughs> you're not, you're, you're, the po politics is a contact sport. It's always been that way. We think our politics is dirty today. Read history. Read, read about past campaigns, read what they said about Abraham Lincoln. I mean, it, our stuff, what we say about each other today is tame in comparison. The only difference is we have, you know, instant and mass communication. But politics is a tough game, and there's nothing fair about it. Qualifications, I mean, you know, it's nice, but that doesn't mean anything. You can have the best resume in the world and not get an endorsement. Uh, it's a very complicated balancing act of understanding what's on people's minds, what you can do for them and how you help them achieve their self-interest. That's what they have to see in you, for the most part. There are a few, you know, ideological zealots and issue people, but when you're dealing with endorsements and, and party structures, you've got to understand there's nothing, no, nothing fair about it at all. It's effective, grassroots politics of getting to 50% plus one, 
inoculating yourself early against potential attacks, that's one way to deal with it. Understand what's going to be coming your way and begin to inoculate yourself early. Begin to get people in positions that will support you early. But it's, it's tough business, and as I think Roger said earlier, if, 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 if you're thin-skinned, if that's going to bother you, if rejection is going to bother you, if attacks are going to bother you, either don't get in politics or get involved in the organizational aspect because it just comes with the territory. It's a rough, tough, knock em sock em business. It's, it's not a civil service test. I mean, it's, and you, it's and the you voters who are deciding. It's not, it's not purely on the merits. The, sometimes the best candidate wins, but sometimes not. You can't divorce human nature from the discipline of politics. It's an impossibility, and therefore it's a sad fact that it's much easier to get voters to be against something than to be for something. And it's easier to get voters to hate than to love. Right. Well, so but, yeah, no, look, I would just say, if you're gonna run, you can't let things stop you. Like, backroom deals, look, the party, party structure may be with you, they may not. You've gotta be ready to run if you're ready to run, and be ready to build your organization if you're ready to build the organization. If you're trying to get to office on somebody else's uh, organization or structure, you're, you're never going to get there, or you're going to get there by being like, you know, a hack, and, and you don't want to do that. Um, people are going to attack you, build your own campaign, build your own messaging, build your own volunteer base, and just run. That's how you do it. Beat them. And beat them. Look, beat people will throw up obstacles, right? You, you're going after somebody else's job here, or what they perceive to be somebody else's job. If you're going to take that away from somebody, you have to expect they're going to resist. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to resist, you, you've just got to fight your way through it. Thank you, panelists. Thank all of you, and good luck. Thank you.